Or you can go full screen if you want. Perfect. Okay, that's good. Yeah. All right. Uh, what it means to do for a speaker today? Uh, this is uh, Tim Crane. Uh, he's an aerospace engineer. He's also vice president of research and development at Intuitive uh, Machinery. Uh, proud alumni of uh, Texas A&M University. No, no, no. no. The, the I think he wants me to mention what year. It's, it's the other university, <laughs> not, not Texas A&M. The other one, the orange one. <laughs> So, uh, he had all his degrees in aerospace engineering. After graduation, he came to work here at NASA, Johnson Space Center, uh, where he worked on many plans involving human uh, space exploration. Uh, this involves uh, navigation systems for both human robotic spacecraft designed for entry, descent, landing, and rendezvous uh, proximity missions. Uh, there was also uh, designs used in the 2009 Mars Science Laboratory and the mini uh, AR, uh, AR Cam 3 flying inspection vehicle, uh, Hubble robotic servicing vehicle, and provided foundation for the Orion crew exploration vehicle. In addition to all that, uh, some of you may know him, he uh, also worked as an adjunct here. Uh, and uh, the UHCL physics program teaching the astrodynamics course. And uh, so some people who've been around NASA for a little bit, and you may remember that course is really popular. So um, I guess uh, five years ago, he uh, helped found a new company, uh, Intuitive Machines, which is doing some really fascinating stuff he's going to tell you guys about. And uh, again, like last week, I want to remind you guys that this is a local company, this is an internship opportunity, so uh, this is somebody who you may want to ask a lot of questions to. Thanks, David. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, about Intuitive Machines as we get into this. Uh, very excited to be here. Seminar series is actually my favorite thing to talk to because um, more or less we want to be here and, uh, and I get to talk about whatever I want, so that's a good combination. Um, as we go through, I have some time at the end for Q&A if you want to debate something or, or go deeper into something. But if something's not clear as we go, don't hesitate to, to raise your hand or something and I'll clarify what it is. So I'm going to provide an overview today of the URV. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about intuitive machines. We'll talk about the motivation. The URV used to be the TRV, the terrestrial return vehicle. Um, I have enough NASA at my DNA but I like my three-letter acronyms, and I can't escape them. But uh, TRV became URV. Talk a little bit about the technology background, and then I'm going to give a design overview. We'll talk about the concept of operations, uh, what we're trying to achieve, where that, that program is, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. Two of the machines, as is, is, uh, Dr. Garrison said, um, we founded in 2013. We felt like a lot of the engineering processes and techniques that we had within NASA could also be gainfully employed in the private industry. So we said, hey, we're still in Houston. Let's do aerospace still. But let's also reach out with some of the same techniques and do uh, energy and medicine. Um, I'm happy to report that we, we've done very well in energy. The biomedical sector is a little bit harder to crack. Their business model is, is challenging. You, they want you to stick with an invention for years and years and years. and it's just a different model than a young startup like us has who isn't focused on a single device, which, which is kind of what they like to do. Um, we like to go after the most challenging problems. So the same thing that drew us to NASA, those kind of uh, monumental challenges and, and the really hard problems, we seek those out in our commercial endeavor. About 75% of the work we do is still aerospace. About half of that's government, half of it's commercial. And then the other 25% is mostly oil and gas. And um, we specialize really in autonomous systems. So the core of our company is guidance, navigation, and control. Uh, taking sensor information, making sense of sensor information, calculating what changes your vehicle or robot or subsea ROV or um, tank inspector needs to change its course, to take action, to move on to the next thing. So if you kind of take that um, smarts that's the part of, of intuitive machines that we replay into other industries and the found traction with. So if you go look at our website, if you, if you search the internet, you might come across some mention of the TRV. The TRV was the original um, 
design idea, the, the original product we were, were trying to put forward, which was to develop what we call the priority small payload return capsule. Um, right now, the International Space Station is serviced by what we like to call the big boats. So you get a Dragon or you get a Cygnus coming up every three to six months. If you're doing an experiment on Space Station or if you need to some, send something back, you have to wait for a Dragon, in particular, to come up and then you reload it because it does re-enter. Then the dragon comes back down, it plunks into the ocean, you send the big boats out, everybody goes around and does the, the Navy SEAL thing, they load it back up, you bring it back in, you unpack it, you ship it. But the logistics on getting payloads back from the space station are challenging. And you can imagine the compression of, of resources and time once that cargo return vehicle comes to space station to get everything done that has to be done and then back onto uh, this free ride home. So one idea was, hey, what if we had an ability to return payloads from space station independent of the big boats coming back? And now that decouples your experiment from those schedule constraints uh, or delays even, you have launch delays, of when the, uh, the Dragon really, and I guess potentially a Soyuz, might be able to bring some of your, your, your cargo back. The Cygnus doesn't bring cargo back, by the way, the orbital Cygnus, that just burns up back on reentry. So you really only have a limited number of options. So this was the terrestrial return vehicle. We, uh, we wrote a proposal to CASIS, which is the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space. They're chartered with basically um, uh, utilization of space station as a national lab. We, we wrote, we got a grant to do the preliminary design. We found a customer who was interested in funding it, and we were able to uh, take that design all the way to what we call a pre-CDR, it's a critical design review. Critical design review is, is a uh, aerospace industry NASA term for, you've already got all your requirements right, you've done some analysis on the design, you're basically ready to build it. And so we're actually a little bit further than ready to build it in some areas, and and just right there and others, including some, some parafoil drop tests that I'll show you some, some uh, pictures of here in a little bit. So we hit a pause. Um, we were sitting with this terrestrial return vehicle, and we've begun looking at what can we do with it other than just coming back from the International Space Station. And it turns out that uh, the technology we're using for the, the TRV uh, can be applied in a broader sense and that's where we get to the universal return vehicle. Whether or not we actually can return from anywhere in the universe is, is a matter of scale, but we'll talk about that. So where did the technology come from? Uh, NASA, in particular, uh, a lot of engineers here at the Johnson Space Center have been studying what's called a mid-lift-to-drag ellipsoid uh, entry body design for over 20 years. And if you've uh, seen Apollo, if you've seen um, the Orion spacecraft, you know, those have that standard kind of capsule design, the big blunt aeroshell. Those are what's called a, a low lift to drag, low, low L over D design. Might get a lift to drag ratio of 0.2. And they can bank and turn a little bit, but they're fairly limited in what they can do once they hit the atmosphere. The ellipse sled is a mid lift to drag. Now you're getting up to numbers like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 on the ratio between lift and drag, which means two things. One, it means you get a lot more cross-range. The re-entry problem is a lot like a skier coming down a slope. They don't go straight down. They do these S-turns to bleed off energy as they come in. They also modulate those S-turns to correct for dispersions when you hit the atmosphere to make sure you land where you want to land. Now, the width of those S-turns from a standard re-entry problem directly relates to your lift-to-drag ratio. The higher your lift-to-drag ratio, the broader those S-turns can be. It means you have more cross-range, is the term we use in aerospace engineering. Uh, if you go above this ellipse sled design into uh, uh, lifting bodies, Sierra Nevada's uh, Dream Chaser, I think, probably has more than a 0 0.3, 0 0.4 L over D, something in that area. I got a head nod from the crowd. Uh, so there's a variety of designs, but this one fits in that sweet spot. Now, the reason NASA's been looking at it they envision a 10-meter diameter ellipsoidal mid-lift-to-drag um, entry vehicle for Mars for putting down many metric tons of human cargo. 
uh, human habitats, uh, nuclear reactors, hydroponic bays, you know, the whole thing you need to set up a, um, an outpost on Mars, one of the trades they use is this design. This is an excerpt from a paper by Chris Saramelli about the Cobra Mars uh, reentry vehicle, which shows a shape very similar to what we are using in the URV for a Mars entry. So um, we formed a partnership with NASA in 2015 with a Space Act agreement, which said, hey, if you'll help us with some of the design and analysis of this shape, we're going to do all the avionics, all the propulsion, all the operations, and we'll give them the reentry data so they can use it to validate some of the analysis they're doing for, for Mars and other, uh, other destinations. The reason we're calling it a universal reentry vehicle is this shape will scale so that it can be used for this International Space Station cargo return. You could send it to the moon and do a lunar sample return with it. Or you could enter at Mars. Actually, you could do a reentry coming back from Mars, all with the same shape. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Oh yeah. Mid lift mid lift to drag ratio also means you only pull about three G's. So instead of slamming down in the atmosphere six, seven, eight uh, gravitational accelerations. This provides a much smoother ride with a minimal to human reuse or biological uh, like rodent sample return from the International Space Station. Okay, so that's the technology background. So <clears throat> when we first started looking at this for ISS, we were saying, all right, what can we do? Um, the idea was that we would use the Japanese modules airlocks called the GEM airlock, which is built with a uh, uh, mechanism called the Cyclops uh, tray or table. I don't know what they call it. Basically what happens is, is you can use the Cyclops to eject payloads uh, into space from the gym airlock. You mount whatever it is you want to eject on the Cyclops. It has a spring mechanism. You close the door on the inner hatch. The outer hatch opens. You reach in with the Japanese arm. You bring it out. You hold it in the direction you want. And then you release the spring mechanism so you can push those. So the first design concept we had was, let's scale this thing down and uh, send it up as a payload on one of the cargo missions to space station, store it, and then uh, when the time is right, you load it, and you put it in the gym airlock, and you kick it up. Uh, it's fully capable of maneuvering in space and landing on a soft target on land or the sea. We'll show you some examples of that. Uh, it could also be a free flyer. So there's no reason this thing couldn't fly on its own. But the initial idea was to put it in the space station. Let me put this in context. How many people work or have aspirations of working in space? A couple, about a third, half maybe. Here's a terrestrial example. Imagine you're taking a direct flight from Los Angeles to New York, and you've got an aunt that lives in St. Louis. And you were supposed to return her baggage to her, and you weren't able to do it. Imagine a bag that as you flew over St. Louis, the airplane would just kick out and that it would automatically fly to your aunt's house in St. Louis. That's pretty much what the TRV is. If now instead of your aunt, it's a scientist, instead of LA to New York, you just stay in orbit. Okay? So there's your, your terrestrial example. This is the ConOps. Uh, we actually tried to sell this to a, uh, a shipping company originally uh, for advertising purposes. You can imagine the parachute coming out and you're having a uh, pick your shipping company logo right there as an advertising uh, thing that didn't quite work out. It turns out this liability issue of bringing something back from orbit. And then, you know. So uh, the idea is is you would uh, uh, first load up the, uh, the TRV or the URV um, at the processing facility. The guys in the bunny suits get in. And, uh, and make sure it's ready to get loaded. It goes up on either a Falcon or a uh, Ares, um, anti Ares rocket. So it's either a Cygnus or a, uh, a Dragon mission. Once it's up on ISS, it gets stowed with all the other baggage. Basically, it'll look something like a uh, um, golf bag. The actual vehicle is about this big. It'll go up and be stowed, and it'll wait for the scientists on board, the astronauts, to perform the experiment. Now, that could take a couple different shapes. It could be the complete experiment 
Or if you had a big enough experiment that you wanted to do that required calibration, you could also envision doing a small sample of that um, experiment and then sending those results home to get them calibrated and then updating the protocols of the test that you're going to run on board. That way you don't, you don't run the whole series uh, without confirming the, the uh, parameters and protocols. So the astronauts run the, uh, run the experiment, and then this is, uh, let's see if I can bring this. You guys see the, there it goes. So this is the Jim airlock. That tray, the Cyclops tray, fits in here. We mount it, the arm reaches out, ejects it. It's completely autonomous. In fact, the original design didn't even have a radio. Completely autonomous. So the vehicle is stowed away inert on the space station. That's called IVA, internal vehicular activity. This is important because that means that our propulsion system has to be compatible with humans in an enclosed area, which put us in a design cycle which required an inert blowdown propulsion system. So a blowdown propulsion system is just like taking a balloon grossly overly simplifying. It's a lot like taking a balloon <laughs> and not tying it off and then releasing it and the pressure just blows out. Okay? We had to make sure that whatever blew out of the engine was non-flammable and non-toxic. In the event that the whole thing released inside a space station, we could not put the crew in jeopardy. So designs for the, uni the universal reentry vehicle, which would never have to go inside a space station, say one that went up to high Earth orbit or went to the moon and back, we can use a different propulsion system that used a combustible bipropellant or monopropellant uh, uh, type of design. So, completely autonomous. It wakes up, it sees the sky, it looks at the stars, adjusts for its attitude and orientation, talks to GPS, calculates the re-entry maneuver. We have uh, the world's most advanced entry guidance algorithm called FNPEG, Fully Numeric Predictive Entry Guidance, F N P E G F N PEG, which with my engineers when they get really upset, they just call it F N PEG. So, but it actually uh, will completely uh, calculate all the maneuvers, all the bank angles, everything until we get down to a parachute deploy. So I'll go into a little bit more detail about that. In the end, it lands on a surface area smaller than this room, about a 15 meter landing footprint. Six hours from the time you close the airlock. So same day delivery, you complete your experiment, you put it in the airlock, you kick it out, that day you have it back there. So I'm going to run through a quick video of what that looks like. By the way, this is the gym airlock. You can see the, the Japanese flag there. This is the uh, external experiment area. That airlock there is where the Japanese robotic arm pulled it out. And then the very bottom, which I just covered, try that. Did it again. Go away. Nope, it's not going to go away. Oh, well. There it is. This is the TRV. If I point at it, apparently it brings up the, uh, the slide advancement menu. So let's look at. So this video is actually um, an animation run with the actual flight software in a high fidelity physics simulation. So we have a NASA simulation called Trick, which runs a package called Geode, which manages gravity and the atmosphere, and we modeled the thruster firings, the mass of the vehicle, its aerodynamics, the whole thing. We also modeled the sensors on the vehicle, and we took the flight software for the TRV and we dropped it in the middle of the simulation. So what you're seeing now is an animation driven by the results of that simulation where the actual flight software executed a complete mission um, ejected from the ISS. So when we leave the uh, uh, Cyclops pins pull that activate a timer, they turn on the power source basically. Uh, the vehicle runs on AA batteries and uh, it powers up and it begins a countdown. And the reason it begins a countdown is we actually have enough change in velocity, enough thrust authority or delta V as we call it in the aerospace world, to leave Earth orbit and hit the atmosphere, which means we also have enough delta V that if we turned around and pointed in the wrong direction, we could intersect with the International Space Station. So we have to get a, uh, a sufficient separation so that if all the systems are optimal, we're able to orient and do a deorbit maneuver. Actually, we do a separation maneuver first and then subsequently do a deorbit maneuver. But 
if we don't make that, um, if the systems aren't optimal and we can't execute the maneuver, we just float away into the cold dark. So, let me pause this. So you guys see right there is a little speck. That's the International Space Station. And I don't know if you can make out, there's a red line kind of coming down and forward. This is what's called a uh, rotating reference frame. It's a local uh, LDLA, it's local vertical, local horizontal. So your frame of reference is stuck on the space station and moving with it as it goes around the Earth. And now you've got all of the spirogyrec type relative motion plots that uh, rendezvous analysts are used to looking at. So what's going to happen is we've been kicked away. We're going to come down, we're going to swoop, we'll come back up. We'll swoop and come back up. And if nothing ever happened different, that would just go on and on and on until differential drag causes us to separate from the International Space Station. So there we go. Each one of these um, scallops is an orbital revolution. So if you go back to your, your fundamentals of uh, kinetic and potential energy, simply what's happened is, is at this point, we have gone down and come back up. And so the orbit of the TRV or the URV in this case is slightly more elliptical than the orbit of the space station because it got that little push. So it's fallen down and then it's come back up one rev later. And uh, that will repeat except for once we're out here we do a nice little maneuver. That wasn't the maneuver. So coming back up, I believe it's on this loop. There it is. Okay, so you see how that kink just formed in the orbit? If we didn't do that separation maneuver, this uh, kind of bow tie pattern would just repeat indefinitely. Okay? But now we've done the separation maneuver. Once we get sufficiently far from the ISS, we'll do the actual deorbit maneuver. Whoa, and there we go. Okay? This is not real time, of course. Okay, a couple different shots now. This is the same view we were looking at before on the bottom left. Um, you have a top-down view in the top right, and then the top left and bottom right views are both different perspectives centered on the vehicle. So you might be able to make out the thruster firings. There's actually no moving surfaces on this vehicle. So there's no rudder, there's no flaps, there's no elevators. It's completely steered by jets. The vehicle itself is statically stable. It will trim out at a certain angle. And we just use the jets to, to steer it kind of like a, uh, really kind of like a surfer. We, we move it back and forth using those jets. So we're beginning to enter the atmosphere now, and that's the S-turns. We've gone to one way. We're coming around. We'll come back, hold it stable, get to about a 25-mile altitude. And we'll deploy a supersonic parachute. Those of you, anybody from California? No Californians? That's uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. So it happens to be on a nice little spot of land. It juts out into the ocean. So what we're able to do is we're able to come on a, a, a reentry path that if we land just right, we land at Vandenberg. If we land short, we splash in the ocean. If we overshoot, we splash in the ocean. So it's a nice uh, starting point for an autonomous reentry vehicle. We're curving in on the first chute. At this point, the vehicle itself is inert. It's not under control. It's just using aerodynamic stability with the parachute to guide its way in. And then the parafoil comes out. And now this parafoil is an ad adaptation of military technology where uh, the military drops these, these big pallets. And it actually has a GPS system of its own. It's steerable. 
it will gauge the winds, and that's what finally brings it in in an area about this size. So to give you an example of what that looks like, let's see. <laughs> Quit that one, coming to here. One of the things we were worried about with the... Uh, with the URV shape was it's very aerodynamic. That, that 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0.4 lift to drag ratio means that it does have flying properties. And so when we were talking to some of the, the suppliers of these parafoil systems, they had only worked with systems before which were not aerodynamic. So the military would put a big pallet together, wrap the whole thing up in cellophane, there's a big brick that falls underneath the, uh, the parafoil. For this application, um, the, uh, the parafoil folks we're working with we're concerned that there might be an interaction between the aerodynamics of this reentry vehicle and the parafoil system. So we did a series of drop tests uh, out in the desert. This is 2015. The general idea is we're going to go up in a um, um, series of altitudes under this helicopter. We'll drop the vehicle and we'll test the door uh, release mechanism on the back of the vehicle. We'll test the winching. Uh, on the motors to bring in the parafoil, and we'll test for aerodynamic stability. So there's a drogue chute to help stabilize the vehicle, and then the door will release. The door will release. There goes the door. We did a total of four tests on the sequence. Three of them were great. Uh, one of them, the, the door didn't release. Um, but we built these, these test articles very uh, affordably. So this was not built to strict aerospace tolerances and a multi-million dollar test article. These test articles were built to be tested and possibly destroyed as part of that test. And so we learned a lot of things about the door mechanism interaction um, under load with that uh, drogue chute that uh, will potentially help us save a vehicle later on. And it's always fun to go out into the field and do rockety stuff. Okay. So back to this guy. Okay. A little bit of detail on, um, on the system. This is our operational timeline. And what you actually see uh, overlaid in this timeline, these circular bubbles, those are actually the software flight modes. So later on, I'm going to show you a, a software schematic. These circles actually relate back to the, the software modes that the vehicle goes through as it sequences autonomously uh, for the reentry. So uh, we have a deploy window. Orbital mechanics are such that you just can't kick this thing out on the wrong side of the planet. You have to be basically lined up where you're going to fly over Vandenberg and, uh, and kick the vehicle out. We get into that deploy window, we release, we exit the keep out sphere, so that's that first go, no go distance. The space station has a series of uh, defined boundaries. They have a keep out sphere, they have an approach ellipsoid. These are basically markers that uh, you restrict the motion of participating vehicles within these different uh, keep out zones. So we get out of the keep out sphere. Um, if the cyclops mechanism failed, we get out a little bit later. That's what this line represents. And at this time, we've gone from idle to uh, a warm initialization. We basically turn the navigation system on. And the navigation system is just tracking the stars and GPS at this time. It's not doing anything. It's just observing where it is. Once the, uh, the timer reaches a certain set point, prop has been inhibited. Propulsion has been inhibited this whole time to prevent an inadvertent firing. At that point, we arm the propulsion system, which in the case of the ISS application, simply means we've applied power to the valves. There's, there's no uh, pyrotechnic system involved. Um, then we begin course attitude control, we basically point the vehicle. So we're basically getting in a pre-entry configuration. We then maneuver to point the vehicle in the opposite direction of its velocity vector to execute the orbit maneuvers, separation maneuvers. Anytime you see a science fiction movie and there's a, there's a shuttle or some sort of spacecraft, and it points towards the Earth and then thrusts towards the Earth. Completely wrong. 
it's always the other way. You always accelerate uh, away to come back. So we do the burn. The first maneuver, the one that we separated from uh, space station width, is about a meter per second. So it's not very large, but that gave that first swoop uh, down and away. And then the big burn, the one that we do later for uh, reentry, is about 107 meters per second. This is important because what we get when we get kicked out from um, space station is about a third of a meter per second. So even our small maneuver is more delta V than we um, were imparted to separate from ISS. We had to do a lot of safety reviews with the ISS community to convince them that we had the right software protocols, operational protocols in place that we would not execute this maneuver uh, until we were well away from space station and had confirmed that all the systems on board were operating normally. And, and that gets back to the risk because the ISS is a, um, a human vehicle, the way we protected the human risk, if we didn't pass all of our checks for nominal onboard operation, we just lost the payload. So that was the, the trade-off we had to make for safety. Uh, another diagram, there's that, that keep out sphere I mentioned before, uh, right in there, a little red circle. That's the approach ellipsoid. So in this reference frame, this is down. This is the velocity direction of the space station. So space station is moving around the Earth in this direction. We swoop. We swoop, we do a separation, and then there we go. Because the vehicle's on a timer, one of the analyses we had to do was, well, what happens if you don't get the full push from that cyclops mechanism? So we looked at the very worst case, and that's this green line where we got barely any separation at all and some minimal value. Well, we proved that even though that was less desirable, it could still safely execute the deorbit maneuver without recontacting the space station. Here's the approach we were talking about before. So this is the California coast. There's Baja. And then this jut of land, that's where Vandenberg is. So you can see, as you come in from the space station, 51 degree inclined orbital altitude, or orbital inclination. We've got a nice spot here, but if we go short, no civilization, no habitated areas. If we go long, uh, theoretically, if we went long, we could hit Baja. But the, uh, the deorbit conditions are such that if you went long, we wouldn't go that far. So we did a complete reentry analysis. In fact, the FAA required us to do the analysis as if the probability of failure of the vehicle were 100%. So we looked at every second from the time we separated down through the atmosphere, what would happen if the vehicle totally stopped responding from there on. And we were able to convince ourselves that we had an acceptable error footprint. In fact, what the design does operationally, we actually target an entry point that's short of the desired entry point. So if the system does go completely offline, we just go into the drink. And then when the control, the guidance system kicks on, it recognizes that it doesn't have the range it needs to make the final target. And some of those S turns, it does a little bit of a lift up to loft the endpoint and, and hit the endpoint. So this is a little operational trick we did. This is some of our nominal analysis. So uh, this is um, a, a dispersion. That same simulation that we use to create that animation has all the aerodynamics and all the aerodynamic dispersions in it. We ran what are called Monte Carlo uh, analyses. So we ran thousands and thousands and thousands of entry cases to evaluate what was the probability of, uh, of our dispersions at two key times. So this, this red is at the drogue deploy. That was the first parachute that came out, the supersonic drogue. And we were targeting this five kilometer ellipse. So we felt comfortable with all the uncertainties on the system. We'd be able to fly down and hit that first five kilometer target. The interesting thing is we're inert under that drogue, if you recall. So we're just flying a parachute. We go from a five kilometer ellipse, and that expands to more uncertainty. Then the parafoil comes out. And then the parafoil's job is to take that uncertainty back out because we're under control again. So the, the ellipse of uncertainty comes down, comes down, comes down, comes down, comes down, because we're guided. The parachute comes out, and then it starts expanding again, expanding again. Then the parafoil comes out, and then it drives us back down to the 15-meter type landing accuracy of about the size of this room. Uh, we did sonic boom analysis. Um, turns out this is something you've got to do with the FAA for reentry vehicles. So turns out for this design, we can land at Vandenberg. We probably won't ever land at Ellington. Um, because the sonic boom would be too much for the populated areas around Houston. 
Just to give you an example, this is what's called an N03 bag, even though it, it looks like a box or maybe a Yeti cooler. This is a standard stowage bag. So the nice thing about the design that we had for, for Space Station is uh, it will fit in that standard cargo. So when the Dragon or Cygnus arrives uh, at ISS and the crew is taking the cargo through the hatch, this is just another you know, kind of white, frizzy-covered bag that they're carrying in there and they're stowing it away in, in the storage spaces on ISS. And it just sits there until the time the crew comes around to doing whatever experiments you might be doing, um, which is a point of interest. What kind of experiments would you be doing? We could return um, up to 20 kilograms and 30 liters back to the Earth's surface. So um, microgravity protein crystal growth, rodent enclosures, um, cell cultures, busted parts, you know, if something broke and you need to do a, a forensic on why did that break and you've got the equipment to do that here, those are the kind of things we'd bring back. <clears throat> so it's exactly the shape it is because this green area is the published volume of the Cyclops ejection mechanism inside the Japanese airlock. We couldn't make it any bigger or it wouldn't fit with inside their safe operating um, volume. And the last thing you want to do is get wedged in an airlock on a multi-billion dollar orbital facility. You can see at the top of, of the top of the vehicle here, this little uh, purple contraption, that's what actually locks into the Cyclops. So the Cyclops grabs onto that with its, its spring loading mechanism. Uh, it is a complete vehicle, even though it doesn't fly up like the space shuttle does. It is a complete vehicle with all the subsystems you would expect. We've got structures. We actually came up with an innovative design, which is an all-carbon composite frame, which uses no fasteners. It actually has a, a zipper-type design. The pieces come together when you run a carbon rod through it, and it locks it all in place. The uh, carbon composite structure will take about 15 Gs. Uh, entry design nominally is for 3 Gs. So we have a lot of capability there. Uh, of course, thermal protection, and I believe I have a slide on that, but just to let you know, we're reusing shuttle tile material for this. There's a surplus of that. We're working with uh, NASA to use that. Of course, payloads, guidance navigation and control system, that's my background. Uh, we have an inertial measuring, measurement unit, which measures change in attitude and change in acceleration, or really change in velocity, measures acceleration. The uh, GPS, of course, is a well-known system, and uh, there's a new generation of star trackers. The way you determine your attitude in orbit, if you take a picture of a field of stars, there's a, a nifty routine. You can go through a star catalog and do some triangular math and identify, as long as you can see them, five stars. By the time you identify five stars in a 4,000 star catalog, by the time you've got five, the odds of you having misidentified what those five are is something like one in 15 trillion. So it's a, it's a great algorithm for Hey, these are these five stars. Once you know those five stars, you can calculate your attitude relative to the, the background sky. An exploded view. Um, because the propulsion system was a blowdown system, an inert material, basically we used firefighter tanks. And they take up about two thirds of the internal volume of the, uh, of the vehicle. Our original design actually had slightly smaller tanks than these. But um, what happens in a thermodynamic system when you release the, uh, release the pressure on a pressurized volume? A anybody? Starts to cool, right? So if you've ever taken a, uh, an aerosol can and you've run it all the way out, it gets cold in your hands. Any scuba divers in here, uh, if you, you blow the tank all the way down, it gets frosty. If you fill the tanks back up, you know, simple thermodynamics if you go back and, and look at the, the equations. One of the problems we ran into was as we blew this down for that 107 meter per second main engine deorbit burn, um, some of our propellant turned to liquid. So our gaseous pr propellant cooled to the point that we ended up getting a liquid. Liquid's no good for a gaseous blowdown engine. So we actually had to expand the volume slightly so that the proportional effect of that blowdown uh, didn't liquefy the propellant. If you've got the, uh, most of your well, we would have to have um, 
limits, but what we did do is we took uh, a very simple analysis first, and we took the point mass of the total CG allocation and moved it from the center of the payload area to the outer mole line, and that was still within acceptable control tolerances. So, pretty good. Um, assuming nobody mounts anything outside the vehicle, we, we should be in pretty good shape. Yeah. Um, and speaking of that, this is the this is the control the the payload area here. You can see the access port there. This is the hatch covering the parafoil. And the way we designed it, the primary heat shield on the bottom is actually separable. So we didn't design it for a reuse, but uh, it could be possible that after the thing landed, we'd pull it apart, reuse the top half, qualify it for flight again, and just slap a new heat shield on it. Our entry conditions are such that um, the, uh, the shuttle tile will deform. So we, we're hotter than the shuttle was on entry, but still within its design, uh, design line. Just not enough where it could be reused. It, it slumps a little bit. Um, I had to pull all the interesting numbers off of this one uh, just to make sure that uh, it was presentable. But uh, a lot of the CG analysis, trim line um, considerations, we trim at about 50 to 60 degrees, depending on uh, Mach number. So that's what these lines are representing. Um, we also had to be uh, aware of where our CG was with respect to that ejection mechanism, because if we were out of alignment and we got kicked, we could get a torque and come back and, and impact the cyclops mechanism. At about Mach 25, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it trims with, with Mach number, so that it, and it's very stable at high angles of attack. So, uh, you know, 50 degrees sounds scary, uh, but it's, it's actually, actually quite stable uh, at that. That was the benefit of taking a design that NASA had been analyzing for 20 years and, and, and bringing it in. And these are the kind of things that NASA helped us with was doing some of the heating analysis for the TPS system. So this is a snapshot in time of an um, aerothermal analysis, which is something similar to computational fluid dynamics, but it's taking our flight condition at, at that... Uh, Mach number at that atmospheric density and, uh, and the constituent components of the atmosphere at that altitude and did a complete analysis of, of what would the heating look like on the vehicle. And so from that, we then came back and we began designing, hey, how much of the vehicle needed to be shuttle tile in the red, how much of it needed to be uh, frizzy, which is that kind of white spacesuit type firefighter suit material, kind of a cloth material. And that's what we use to do these was on these uh, 1,300 and 1,000 degree split lines. But a whole series of these were done. But the interesting thing is, if you go look in the literature, a lot of the designs that NASA's looked at for these ellipsoidal entry vehicles, they almost look like bullets. They're, they're very rounded and, and sometimes scalloped off. We actually went through 12 design iterations with NASA on this because we found out the first one we had was uncontrollable at Mach 5. Um, the jets we had, one pound jets, uh, couldn't control the vehicle and we were going to a flat spin at Mach 5. So then we went back and we added a, uh, a ridge along the bottom, bottom side, kind of a, a keel almost. But at Mach 5, what you need for a keel is very, 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 very subtle. So it doesn't look like a, like a straight line keel like you're used to on a sailboat. It's just a very small rise in the shape. That got, got us down to Mach 3, and then we had to come back and do a couple of iterations on the, on the vehicle back here. So what we were really able to do is take this academic um, trade study kind of design that NASA had been refining and move it to the next level because we were getting very specific about the details of the outer mold line. What's that? Uh, Bobby Brown? Yeah, yeah, Bobby Brown. He's, um, he's been in the, uh, the guided entry community at NASA and academia for quite a while. I actually worked with him when I first started at NASA. A lot of the work he's doing, though, is not on the ellipsoidal shape. It's more on the conical ballistic entry where it just hits the atmosphere and goes straight in, more of the high G type stuff. Yeah. But same field, absolutely. This is a, a view of how we mount to the cyclops mechanism. So there's that, uh, that gripping mechanism, you, you see this kind of spring load. So that whole thing would kind of lock back and then it would eject us and give us that, that 0.3 meters per second when we came off. 
of course, two parachutes. Um, this is my baby. So we developed an approach for very efficient software development and software reuse on a project called Morpheus. <coughs> About, oh, geez, is it really that long ago? Four years ago, five years ago, you might have seen a rocket being tested out in the field behind JFC. We set the field on fire. It's great, <laughs> great, great publicity. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> so um, we found a way to reuse a lot of the software that NASA had already developed and, and got about an 85% reuse out of the code. So um, there's open source software called Core Flight Software. It's kind of like a spacecraft operating system that NASA has developed at the Goddard Space Flight Center. It provides a lot of your basic services, and then you can host your specific applications within that, your guidance, your navigation, your control. So we use that for our flight software architecture. There's also the open source trick simulation architecture. That's a framework that you can tie a simulation into, atmosphere, engines, gravity, torque, all that kind of stuff. And then at the time, we, uh, we were also using um, a program called ITOS. Again, uh, something NASA had used over and over and over. And we pulled that stuff out. This approach, we kind of prototyped and stumbled our way through on Morpheus. It turns out about half the company at the time we were doing the, uh, the URV development were uh, um, Morpheus refugees, or uh, we hired them away from Morpheus, or stole them from NASA, depending on your perspective. So this is an approach we're very familiar with. Um, yeah? Ah, yeah. That, uh, so it's an open source uh, software. And as uh, you might know, any of you do computer programming, uh, there are many shades of what open source can mean from, hey, it's yours. If, if you do something bad with it, it's on you, it's not on me, to uh, if you attach any other software to it, not only do you have to give back the software I let you borrow, you have to also give the attached software back. CFE comes with just that requirement that if you modify CFE, those modifications you've got to give back. But the application code that you write that you host within CFE is not CFE. So it's just in that right spot. Now, let me give you an example of what that would look like. Say you were developing a heart surgery simulation, and you went to uh, a great biomedical research institution, let's say, uh, I don't know, Mayo Clinic, and you get their cardiovascular simulation environment. And they say, hey, if you make any changes in the cardiovascular simulation environment, you've got to give it back to us. But you write your own heart model that the simulation environment talks to that heart model as a separate process and application. You didn't change what they gave you to wrap around it, but you wrote your own piece within it. And so that's kind of that, that area. Now, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. It's a great question, though. It's one for our oil and gas customers. We have to be very, 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 very careful about because we do use a lot of open source code in other, other areas. And if you're not careful, you could deliver something to a customer that they have to end up sharing with their competitors because you didn't observe. Yeah, all of that stuff you have to make sure you manage in your configuration management process, for sure. Um, just another example, I mentioned that that core flight software came with a lot of built-in capability. That'd be all this green and blue. If you imagine these are processes and, and uh, software that already exists, things like limit checking, um, data storage, table services, um, timing services, all the things you might need from an operating system. This comes with CFE and CFS. All the stuff up on the top side, automated flight management, deorbit guidance, um, IMU processing, those are all the applications that we wrote to complement what you were able to get freely from NASA to make a full uh, flight software build. The GNC schematic, it's uh, fairly simple. Deorbit targeting, deorbit guidance, a uh, um, very high speed navigation processor, entry guidance, control at 25 hertz, common filters uh, running on the GPS data. So a fairly standard uh, AFM. A schematic of our operating modes in the software. Remember when I showed you the uh, 
graphic of the vehicle leaving the space station. I, I called out those bubbles. These are the same modes. This is the software mode idle, and we go from idle to warm and knit. And this just shows the sequencing of our state machine um, through the different modes of flight. One of the things that we did, uh, we genericized the maneuver sequence. So we've got this maneuver to deorbit attitude, deorbit burn, and then maneuver to EI attitude. This was an earlier version of our, our software. Later, we took that and we genericized the maneuver sequence. So it could be a deorbit maneuver, it could be a separation maneuver, or we could rehost that software on a different vehicle and do trans lunar injection maneuvers or, or whatever the, the vehicle called for. We're big believers in testing whenever we can, so we, we develop techniques uh, for initially hosting our, our flight software in the simulated environment. That's what drove the animation you saw earlier. As far as the flight software knew in this green and blue bubble, it was running on a flight processor, but in fact it was just running in a, uh, uh, a simulation environment. But then we can move that to a standalone application, which is now talking to simulation over a process that begins to separate the simulation from the flight software. And then as we become more advanced, we actually move the um, flight software into its own processor, and the simulation runs on a different processor and communicates over a real-time protocol. So now you're getting more and more flight-like. By the time we were at uh, pre-CDR, we actually had the software running on the flight processor and configured so that we had a nightly build check where the simulation would run in real time overnight and give us a report the next day of what was the status of the flight software build. Not original. We got that from SpaceX. But it's a great idea. So flattery and, and compliments and imitation and all that. Okay. Ah. Yeah. So uh, engineers, especially GNC engineers, we love our Monte Carlo simulations. We like to take the physics of the universe, wrap it around the vehicle performance, wrap it around the software that's going to run on the vehicle, make it think it's actually the vehicle itself, and then we run thousands and thousands of trajectory cases. So that's the keep out sphere again, the little circle up on the right. That's the approach ellipsoid, the bigger circle. Then each of these colored lines is a different Monte Carlo realization of a mission. And the values I have listed on the left are all the different things we changed. So we would change the initial pitch angle of ISS. We would change the CG location of the TRV. We would change its inertia properties, uh, the thrust or force magnitude, the properties of the inertial measurement unit and the star tracker and the GPS, the thrust level of the main engine, the percent of the deorbit orbit burn we actually got. And not one at a time. We would change them all together. So each of these values had a statistical distribution based upon our best understanding of how the system would perform. And when you sum those up, this is the kind of performance you would get. So now if you take these trajectories all the way down to parachute deploy, you get the plot that I showed you earlier with that five kilometer ellipse and all the red dots in it. And, and this is the way we validate our design. What was your, uh, your um, no, we didn't do we well. We had a risk managed approach. We were trying to do the whole design in 24 months. We got about 12 months into it. So um, we were designing for minimal failure, but we did not have a standard NASA prove to me that your three sigma um, buyer's remorse. We would do three sigma seller's remorse. So that's what a thousand trajectories looks like. Very interested in how long it took for us to um, cross that keep out sphere. So this is just a uh, histogram of how many cases took what amount of time. I just wanted to make sure that we use this to set our timer on activating the propulsion system appropriately. So looking at this, you could argue that, hey, if I set my timer to 1,200 seconds, I capture the majority of cases where I've uh, left the keep out sphere behind. Similarly, um, looking at the, the velocity at, uh, at parachute deploy versus run numbers, these are all the kinds of things that once you have that simulation set up and running, 
that you really begin pulling apart to try to understand what the design performance margin in the system is. The supersonic drogue comes out about Mach 3. So the exciting regions between Mach 5 and Mach 3, that transonic, uh, super, the hypersonic region is where you're kind of getting towards the end of your control authority, but you haven't quite brought the parachute out yet. Right? So uh, did a lot of work between Mach 5 and Mach 3. Then that parachute comes out. And then we get down subsonic when the, the parafoil comes out. So that's the design in a nutshell. Um, free to take any questions. I will, I will mention one other thing we did that I don't have a chart for, but it's, it's kind of a, well, I think it's interesting. I mentioned we were having problems at Mach 5. So Mach 5, the vehicle was going in a flat spin, and the thrusters, we had uh, two pods of thrusters on the back of the vehicle somewhere, bless you, somewhere back here, we had two, two pods of thrusters. They were one-pound thrusters. First of all, for someone who's used to working on Mars entry vehicles and shuttles, a one-pound thruster just sounds like a ridiculously small type thing. So this whole vehicle weighs less than 300 pounds. So, you know, once you do the torque and stuff, one-pound thruster is about what you need um, for this vehicle. But we were hitting these flat spins, and we started getting into a cycle where we'd, we'd make a design change recommendation, and we'd send it to NASA, and then it'd take them a week or two to do. I mean, this is very, very intense computations to get these kind of analyses out. Then they'd get it back to us. We'd update the aerodynamics in our simulation, and we'd run the analysis again, and we'd, we'd find out we did a little better, a little worse. Um, we actually 3D printed a couple of versions of the, uh, of the TRV and it's something about the size of this, this Starbucks cup. So it had a, a small shoe size 3D print of the Adam Moldbine. And we configured it where we could change the CG in it, and we built our own wind tunnel, subsonic wind tunnel. Um, it used a shop fan and 10,000 straws as flow straighteners. Probably cost us about 250 bucks. Clearly not a certified wind tunnel facility. But we were still able to use it to get enough insight about the trim characteristics of the vehicle under spin conditions. So we'd spin it up and let it go, spin it up and let it go, and we could observe the damping at subsonic conditions. And we used that to provide feedback to NASA, and it probably saved us four or five design iterations. So we didn't claim by any means that we were validating a hypersonic design with a $250 wind tone. Rather, we used it to gain insights and intuition in a way that we could interact with and then we use that to make recommendations to NASA, who would then put it into their design tools and come back and say, yeah, you know what, it turns out those recommendations were valid, and it really accelerated um, the convergence of our, our out of mobile design. So it's just one of those little things that, you know, sometimes you can go with the, uh, uh, the super high fidelity, large facility, validated approach, but that can be an endpoint as opposed to a starting point. And we save a lot of time and money by using some simpler techniques for starting points and then submitting those for consideration with those endpoint analysis tools, which are much more sophisticated and much more expensive to run. So, okay, that's it. Any questions? Questions. Yep. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. Um, that would be a, a bad day. I will say, though, one of the things that we've been looking at, so there's a long story of, of funding and stop funding and restart funding, and now we're looking at this again, and we're in a sales mode, so we're, we're out talking to folks about the URV. Um, one of the things we're considering is net capture. So the, uh, if you go online, I believe SpaceX captures their shroud their launch shroud with a boat with basically a giant trampoline in the back of it. They just drive the boat underneath this thing as it comes down and shoots and they usually grab it. So another, another approach we've had in order to um, completely eliminate, not completely eliminate, but mostly eliminate the possibility of hitting a populated center is to just push the whole landing site um, out into the water and drive underneath it with a you know, speedboat and snag it out of the air. So that's another approach. But it, it lands, it, it's actually kind of cool watching it land. I don't think I had, we don't have any video, but when it hits, it just kind of, you know, bumps along. 
and uh, it's kind of neat to watch. Any other questions? So because your contacts, you know, Uh, actually, no. The, uh, we did the analysis, and uh, we can pack the payload um, with uh, with ice, ice blocks, and it will maintain that temperature. So the heat soak is what you'd be worried about, and um, we don't soak through, so you can maintain cold or room temperature all the way down to the surface. Now, if you don't go we'll get it once it lands, you know, eventually that 1,300 degrees will work its way through and, and melt whatever you did. But we felt like we could we could bring frozen samples back, um, still frozen. Yeah, for sure. Now, take the same design. Uh, like we said, you could put it on a lander, land on the moon, and uh, put a, an accident package on it. you got to get off the moon, right? But uh, a very similar design to this would be able to do uh, reentry from a drop all the way back from the moon. TPS would be different. I mean, there'd be some, there would be some changes. It wouldn't be a build to print, and hey, now I can go anywhere in the universe. Um, but the design changes would be minimal. Uh, I think I remember a project where they were, they were looking into like an emergency um, crew escape vehicle from the International Space Station. Yeah, the X-38. Yeah. yeah. Right. So were they thinking a pop, another possibility to scale something like this up to that level? Uh, we've been asked that. Uh, the NASA administrator actually asked us when we presented this, could you, could you make it an escape pod? And that's something we're looking at, too. However, this is the caveat. Remember I said our approach to human safety was if all the systems didn't work normally when we left ISS, rather than risking the recontact with the space station, we would just go dark and the vehicle would, would fade away and eventually reenter on its own. So you'd lose your business opportunity to bring a payload home but you would preserve the life of the crew on space station. Because this design was a single string design. Everything had to work. And, you know, these are reliable parts. There's not a whole lot of risk there. But if they didn't, you lose the whole thing. For the escape pod, everything has to be triply redundant. And, and now the cost would go way up. Except for this. If you built this, and you flew 10 or 12 of them out of the space station, and you had a backlog of performance and you understood the systems and you had all that flight heritage and then you said, could you make me a human rated version? I think that's a lot cheaper than if you started out with, hey, build me a human rated version from the beginning and layer all of that requirements of reliability and, and triply redundant from the beginning. If you know the design basically works and you're scaling up and now adding the redundancy, I think it's a better approach. But yeah, I would love to build an escape pod. Um, the X-38 was, uh, was a, was a, a JSC-led effort that uh, would, would basically take a crew of six from the ISS. And uh, they were working on that just about the time I started at the Johnson Space Center, sort of winding down. But um, it would be neat to take this and make it a single person thing. So here's, here's the very real problem you run into right now. Let's say you're on space station. You've got two Soyuz up there. Each Soyuz takes how many people home? Three, right? So I got six people on space station. I got two Soyuz. One of the people on the on space station gets a kidney stone. Now they break out the ultrasound. They do their whole thing. Kidney stone doesn't go away. Person starts bleeding. Now you got a situation. What do you do? You can't put one person in a Soyuz. You put three. Flight rules are you can't have more people on board space station than you have the ability to bring them home. So one person gets sick, three people come home. The nice thing about an escape pod would be as an additional type system, if you had that one person get sick day, instead of having to de-crew de half the people from the space station, put the sick person in, this is actually a much nicer ride. That, that three Gs is much better than what you pull on a Soyuz, which looks like a diving bell. Um, so that would be an application. Of course, space station is deorbiting in 2025, so we might have missed our window there, but hopefully uh, commercial space stations will think about that kind of escape pod issue and, and crewing and decrewing the spacecraft. 30 liters, and I want to say 20 kilograms. Might have been 20 pounds, I think 20 kilograms. What's that? Uh, on the bump at the bottom or, or during the atmospheric entry? 
uh, I think it was a shock of less than six Gs. So it wasn't wasn't much. It was pretty pretty low. One of the things we did avoid the um, parafoil has the option to do a flare at the last minute, but to really get that to work, you need an altimeter, and that's just a layer of complication. So we decided to to take the bump and. Uh, Damage the heat shield. That's why the heat shield's separable, so we can get rid of it and throw it away. Now, my plug. Um, Intuitive Machines is located in the first floor of the Boeing building, which you'll notice is just across the street. Right? We have a vibrant internship program. Uh, we just closed our summer internships. So, uh, nothing for the summer, but uh, we're open again in the fall. Now the way our internships work is we look at our projects and see which projects need support. I would say though if you're interested in um, uh, doing some work, uh, some analysis work, some work for hire, outside of the internship program that's something we do too. So uh, if you're a programmer, if you're an analyst, if you're a physicist, um, don't hesitate to go to our careers page and submit your um, uh, resume. Uh, you can send it to me. My uh, email is Tim at intuitivemachines.com. Nice thing about a small company. You get first name emails. At least the first 15 of us did. Um, yeah, and you know, no promises, but uh, we, we don't know you're there unless we have your resume and, and the kind of things you do. And we're uh, excited to have UHCL out, out of our back door. And we'd like to have closer ties with both the, uh, the student body and the faculty here. So um, if you're interested in these kind of projects or any of the other things you see on our website, uh, don't hesitate to send me your resume. And uh, we'll see if we find a match. But I uh, appreciate your time. This was a, a fun project. Welcome. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to just do a quick pause for next week just so everybody gets on the same page. Uh, hold on before you do that. Oh, you <laughs> um, next week, we've got um, uh, Sean Stewart is going to be here. Uh, also from Intuitive Machines, he's going to be talking about uh, using physics and video game technology to build a commercial drilling training simulator. So, um, it's also some more interesting work from uh, Intuitive Machines.